everybody moved up. We got two magazines over here, and I don't know how many we have left. But if you got if you didn't get one, there's a few left over here. We publish both of these magazines, and we are the AI Room Company. And I don't know how much you know about the AI Room Company, but next year is our 150th anniversary. And our president is fifth generation group. And <coughs> We are now primarily, we have migrated from a visa supply company to primarily a great big candle manufacturing company. Uh, and that's what we do mostly. But when we put manufacturing visa supplies about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, they kept the magazine because they like the legacy of the company being in bees and beekeeping. So that's what I've been doing for about 30 years here. Uh, but next year is our 150th anniversary. And I don't want to close there because I don't want to And we're going to be doing a few things in the magazine, gaining attention to a lot of the history of the company and to the industry that we are a part of. So uh, kind of check that out if you can get a chance. Uh, what else do I need to say about the new company? <coughs> That's all? That's a nutshell. That's a nutshell. Okay. 150 years next year. 149 this year. I'm, I've been part of it for 30, so that much. How do we mean nutrition? It's finally getting enough attention. And when, when, when all of the stuff with colony collapse disorder uh, kind of first hit, people were trying to figure out what was going on, and after 10 years, they've kind of narrowed it down to, to uh, pesticide exposure to raw and the viruses, and other pests and diseases and not enough good food. And, and, and that's one of the things I want to talk about here. I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about what bees eat and, and why it, what they eat is important. And then how you as a beekeeper can manage honeybee nutrition. What do you need to be doing to make sure that your bees have enough good food all of the time? And I lost my point. I lost my clicker. And it, that's really pretty simple. I mean, when you think about it, it's really, it's really pretty simple. Honeybee nutrition, enough good food all the time for every bee in the bush. Any questions? I wish it was that simple. Uh, but it boils down to that. Enough good food all the time for every bee in the bush. Because the minute you start stressing the bees with nutrition, all sorts of ripple effects happen in the colony. And I want to look at, I want to look at what, what's going on, and then we're going to look at what you can do to, to help. This is, this is basically, this is almost something okay, it's almost weird to be up here this time. Is it okay? Okay. A cell phone, a cell phone. Oh, see? That does sound weird. Right here. One, two, three. Feedback, done. Okay. I'll, We'll see what happens. A cell column, a cell of honey, and a cell of water to make a bee. That's what it takes to get from egg to adult bee. That much food. It's only that much food, but it's that much food. Now think about this. Now you've got a visual. When you're looking at a frame of a frame in your colony, and you say, okay, I've got this much open brew. I'm going to need this much. I'm going to need this much pollen, and the bees are going to have to have access to this much water. Do all of those exist right now, today, while I'm standing here? If they don't, then you need to be doing something to make sure that they do. And you need to make sure that it's happening not just now when you're here, but tomorrow, the next day, the next week, three weeks. That's your, that's, your, that's your window. Your window is always three weeks. You need to be looking three weeks ahead. What's going to be happening three weeks from now? Because that's when all of this bunch of brood is going to be coming, coming into being, and being adults. So a cell ball and a cell honey and a cell of water are going to be. Do you have enough? Will there be enough coming in over the next three weeks? There it is. Meat potatoes. From a honeybee's perspective, nectar and pollen. That's their diet. That's what they eat. They're vegetarians. And this is the one happy honeybee right here, let me tell you. So let's take a look at what this is. This is the meat. And the meat, of course, is protein and it's pollen. And pollen has fats and vitamins and minerals and expression of proteins. But fats and, think about this. Where do honeybees get fat in their diet? You know, that they have to have, just like you and I, they have to have fat and they have to have vitamins and they have to have 
add them all this good stuff. Sugar ain't it. Feeding bean sugar is junk food. It's the only thing we can do in bulk and do it well. We can get, at least get carbohydrates into their diet. But sugar is junk food for them. This is the fast vitamins, minerals, and proteins that they need in their diet. So when you're feeding sugar as a last resort, that's not the first choice. It's the last resort. This is what they need. This is where they get these things from pollen. Essential amino acids, and, and you can, uh, if, you're, if you're a biochemist, you can read all of these amino acids and how much, how much they, where do I stand? How much they, of uh, each of these that they need in their diets. Pollen comes, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, the bell curve is this wide and this tall in terms of the amount of protein in, in pollen depending on the source. Some plants have lots and lots of protein. Primarily legumes. If you look at uh, protein sources, legumes are always a good choice. If you have a, a place to put these and, and safe from ag chemicals, legumes are a good choice. We stopped by an alfalfa field yesterday. Probably the best honey and protein source you can get in terms of this country is alfalfa. It's a wonderful, wonderful protein, wonderful that it makes a wonderful honey. But you're looking at legumes and having higher, always having higher protein. Minimum 20 to 25 percent. Now you can go on the internet. I'm not a big advocate of telling anybody to go on the internet looking things up because I'm always, I'm always hesitant to push the quality of the information. But a million studies have been done by universities and, and research scientists that said, what is the protein pollen content of pollen? And you can find lots and lots and lots of lists that are reputable done by good people. And I encourage you to do that because you, you know where your bees are going and what they're eating. And, and are they eating junk food or are they eating good stuff? And if your primary colonies are primarily, primarily where there's junk food, you're going to think twice about maybe moving them over here because this is better stuff. Not only egg chemicals and all that, but just the quality of the food they're, they're exposed to and can give you. Now, your bees can probably fly from here to there to get the good stuff. But is moving them there a better choice? Just that they're going to be surrounded by better food. So take a look at take a look at those lists, and then take a look at what your bees are eating, and see if maybe you can make an improvement on their location. Uh, a whole bunch of protein notes here, and we're going to go through some of these. 15 to 120 pounds of pollen per year, depending on on how much how much protein is in that pollen. If we're collecting corn pollen you're going to collect more than 120 pounds because corn pollen is essentially worthless. You've got to eat a ton of corn pollen to have you know, hardly any protein at all. So if you're eating lots and lots of corn, you're not going to have to collect a lot more. Now, think of the efficiency of that. I've got to make 10 trips to a cornfield to, to, to uh, equal three trips to a soybean field. Is What's the value of that corn pollen? Not only is it not very good, but I have to work hard to get it. So, Take a look at that. For every 20 grams of protein needed, the colony has to collect 48 grams of 30% crude protein, or 72 grams. And there's the efficiency scale right there. How much work do I have to do for crab pollen? And and if you if you or if your bees are mostly collected the bad stuff, you may want to get them to someplace better. Uh, sometimes you see an imbalance of amino acids. In that first slide we had up your head. The amino acid balance that you need, and those charts that you'll find on the internet have the same thing. You may have, for instance, basswood pollen has a really skewed uh, amino acid profile. It's got lots of some of it, hardly any of it. There's lots and lots of it, but you're not getting much of some of the amino acids of basswood, so you need to counter that with something else that's blooming, hopefully, at the same time or stored from before. Basswood pollen and locust pollen together are perfect. And where I'm from, we get that mix a lot. We've got both stored in the, in the colony. So we have our, my bees are doing really well because I can get some of this and some of this, and I end up with a balanced diet for my kids. And that's what you want to be able to see. If, if, I, if, the, uh, uh, if, if the pollen profile gets screwed up or the pollen source gets screwed up, what happens is if you have not have enough pollen collected, no matter the protein, uh, if it goes down 20 percent, less than 20 percent, all sorts of things start going bad in the colony. If you don't have enough protein, if you don't have enough protein, 
not only not enough pollen, but enough protein. And that's what you've got to be looking at. You see that ring of pollen around the edge of your honey, you say, yeah, they got <coughs> pollen. Well, is it any good? Where's the junk food? And, and you need to be knowing where they're going and where they're getting it and the value of it. The other thing, I bet, you, I bet you there's at least one other person in this room besides me who takes a pill for cholesterol. I, I got too much of it in my diet and I, my body doesn't regulate it and I have well, just like us, we need cholesterol. They have to have some, but they don't have to have too much. It's the same sort of thing. They can look at those profiles and find uh, But fats are attractive and where, where, where else do bees get fat in their diet? The only place is in protein. And, it's, and, and I've mentioned chickens in here and, and if, you, if you know anything about chickens, where do chickens get fat in their diet? You know, we feed them chicken food, and there ain't no fat in chicken food. It's the bugs that they're eating in the ground, and, and, and the, you know, the wild things that they're catching when they're free-ranging. My chickens live in a pen, and they, there, there are no bugs left in my pen, let me tell you. They've all been eaten twice. So we have to provide that, that fat for them from some other source. So my chickens, you ever see a chicken eat a mouse? Yeah. It's, if you don't, I don't like mice in my chicken pen, so I, when I catch mice in my chicken anyway. <laughs> fats are attractive in, in their diet for all the reasons that fats are attractive to you. And they, they add flavor, certainly that's one of them, but they also add lots of, lots of uh, healthy attributes to their diet. Lipids are the same thing, fatty acids, sterols, and phospholipids. All of these things are required in their diet, and the only place that they can get up is in pollen and the only, the, the better the pollen, the better your diet's going to be. So I, I, I'm going to say this plain times. Find out where your bees are going, where that pollen's coming from. Hmm. Minerals, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, all required by all insects, sodium, calcium, sodium, chloride, and minerals. Anybody here on a salt restrictive diet? Say yes, because lots of us are. It's because there's too much salt there from the same thing with bees. Again, take a look at the protein source. What are they getting? Is there a lot of salt in, there, in the pollen that they're getting? They have to have some ash in there, just like us, fiber in their diet, so they can aid digestion. They have to have some, not a lot, but they have to have some, and that getting it all from pollen. And vitamins, B complex A and K are essential for hyperpharyngeal gland and root development. If you start showing those two vitamins in the diets of your worker bees, your workers aren't able to process hyperpharyngeal hyperpharyngeal food, or the gland is able to process hyperpharyngeal, I'll get it out yet. Food, and therefore they're not able to feed the young. So your younger get shorter. Not, not because there isn't food, but because there isn't these vitamins. And it's, and it's the quality of the food you're feeding your younger. Your younger either, either they die at an extreme shortage, or they grow up stunted, or they grow up not as healthy as they could have. So they're going to be needing those vitamins. If you, if you, um, anybody here collect pollen to sell to, you know, health food stores or whatever? Boy, you're missing. Does anybody here own a pollen trap? Two people. Oh my gosh, three. Get a pollen trap. This year, get a pollen, here's why. What are you feeding back to your bees for protein supplement next spring when you want that colony to build up? You're feeding something you got from man like, right? Brown, gooey stuff that doesn't smell good and looks bad? Or are you feeding pollen that you trapped this summer, stored in the freezer and fed to them next spring? What's your best choice? Better than even a choice. Get a pollen trap. Use it. Collect pollen. Store it in the freezer. You don't have to clean it. The bees don't care. Take it out of the pollen trap, put it in a plastic bag, brush it down, put it in your freezer, get a stack of it. Get a pollen trap. You are missing, you're missing, you that. you're missing all of this good food. You put a pollen trap, you open it up one day, and you collect all the pollen that they collect for one day, and suddenly, if you left it on for a week, they would change their foraging routine. They would change way more foragers into pollen collecting. But for one day, they're not even going to notice that you've got four, four bags full of pollen for next spring for your colonies that you're starting your splits or your packages. Get a pollen trap. Can I repeat that? 
Story and missing an incredible resource that you could be using in your user info. Thank you. I don't like that wrong gooey stuff. So we get a pop anyway. Vitamins, if, if you're if you're driving on and you're gonna sell it out, you've got to crack the object and start collecting it to sell it. Ooh, you know, a pound goes for a pound. You know, 11, 12 bucks a pound. What's honey going for a pound? Hmm, less. So, you get a pollen trap, collect pollen, feed it to your bees, but you can sell some to the farm market, wherever it is that you're selling your honey. If you're going to do that, then you have to clean it. You have to get the dead bees out of it, and, and there's a little work involved. That, especially dead, dead in the middle legs of bees. Not the pollen basket legs, and not the front skinny legs. It's the middle legs of bees that get caught in pollen traps for whatever reason. They're, I don't know, they're longer or bigger or something. Anyway, you'll, you'll find dead legs in your pollen, you gotta clean them out. But when you're selling this stuff, you wanna, you wanna free, the, the, the best way to preserve all of the attributes that people want in pollen is to freeze it, but then it gets mushy. So then you dry it, and when you dry it, the thing that happens is the vitamins tend to deteriorate. So when you're selling it to a, to a uh, health food store, you know, if you're coming in with a pound, a Queen Line pound jar full of it, you're going to sell it to them for, you know, 12 or 15 dollars, know that it's dried and know that the protein or the, the vitamin content has been reduced some. But if you freeze it, you save all of that, but it's mushy and messy. So it's a trade-off, depending on where it is you're going to sell it and what they're looking for. But know that you can sell this stuff. You can feed it to your bees, but you can also sell this stuff, and people pay good money for it. Here's what happens when you run out of pollen. Why are you supposed to have in the hand pass real quick? You get reduced brood production overall because there's not enough food to feed them. So the, queen sl the bees slow the queen down. The queen doesn't stop. They slow her down. They stop feeding her and they regulate her behavior so that she doesn't lay as much. If it gets a little bit worse, there isn't enough food and the workers don't live as long. They're just not getting fed enough when they're young and they're not getting fed enough when they're once they become adults. Uh, it takes drones longer to reach maturity, and if you're a good producer, that's a problem. You want your drones coming up right on schedule, right on schedule, right on schedule, so that you've always got drones out in the drone congregation area, and if you've got a food shortage, that's not happening, and you've got a problem. You have drones that aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're reduced fertility. They don't fly as far, they don't fly as fast, and they don't have as much sperm. And if you're a queen producer, or you're just letting your colonies reproduce themselves, that's a problem. Drones are neglected, discarded, and the retirement program for drones really stinks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can you imagine being eaten? There's fewer drones, so at, 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 drones are good. We're going to talk about drones later. There's fewer drones in a colony. Um, when, when, food is, when food is short, the drones are the first ones to be, to be selected to say, okay, the first thing we do is we, we put, we put hardly any energy into drone larvae, so we'll get rid of those first. They go out the door first. And then drone pupa. We put some energy into those, but not as much as into drone bell, so we'll get rid of the drone pupa. And they go out the front door. And then if food gets even worse, then the adult drones go out the front door. Like I said, the retirement program stinks. But that's the bird progress. And if you're, if you're looking at your colonies one day and you see a whole bunch of drone larvae or drone people out on the front door, you can bet, you can bet and, and, and know that there's food issues going on in that colony because these are the first guys who get shoved out the door. They're the least valuable, they make no contribution, and if I've got this much food and I've got to feed this many people, guess who I'm not going to feed first? I'm not going to feed the drones. So that's a good cue for you to look for when for food shortage is if there's dead drones up front. Eventually, of course, the, the, the colony will start if you've got no protein coming in. But drones are a good indicator uh, of what's going on. Now this is, this is for Ohio. I don't know your 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 uh, power sources here, but for us, canola, 23% uh, crude protein, buckwheat, 11%, sunflower, 15, lavender, alfalfa, 21. Good, 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 good protein source. Pine, you know the the, the spring when the pine formed pine, you know, that dust all over your car, you know you can sweep up a pail of it, and it isn't worth the time you feed it to your bees. It's just the protein is so, so low. Almonds are really good 
Um, the, the commercial beekeepers who take their, their bees to almonds for pollination, they run into issues with pesticides, of course, and some other things. But what I tell you, the bees raise bees raise brood on almond, almond nectar and pollen like man. They come out of there, they, by the time they come out of there, almost always they have to split because there's an explosion of brood. Pears aren't bad. Uh, protein at 26 percent. Remember, 20 percent is the minimum that you want. Uh, if you can, if you can possibly manage it, so 26 is pretty good. Raspberries and blackberries, 20 percent. Clover, 25. Again, the legume does well. They're up high. Blueberries, 14. Not so much. Beans, another again, the legume up over 22 percent. Corn, 15 percent. Not worth the trouble to go collect. Just a little good bother. Peas, again, another legume, 30 percent. Willow, 18. Just barely under 20, but there's so much of it in the spring where we are that it kind of makes up volume, makes up for quality. Locus again, I like you, 25%. So know where your bees are getting their, their pollen and you'll be able to predict the quality of, of the food that's being stored in your colony and that will tell you what you have. Now that you know, again, the better the quality, the more brood you can raise, the more bees you're going to have three weeks down the road. That's the window that you're looking at. Potatoes. <laughs> Carbohydrates in your life. <coughs> Primarily sugar and water. That's what that's the carbohydrates that needs to be. But of course it isn't just sugar. It's the sugars that are in nectar are fructose and glucose, and these are the ones that promote crystallization. The higher the higher the ratio of glucose, the quicker the, the uh, nectar, the honey will crystallize. From the bee's perspective, you don't care. From your perspective, you're probably going to. Water has to be reduced to less than 17 percent. You're going to get fermentation, and the sugar content in, in nectar is going to range from five to 75 percent. I'm 75 percent sugar in nectar. What would you like to have a fill of that next door? It hardly have any, any dehydration to get rid of that water. And that one is 25 to 40 percent. Most of the nectars you're going to see are pretty good. 25 to 40 percent. There's other sugars that are in nectar. There's proteins, amino acids, enzymes, lipids, organic acids, vitamins, and antioxidants, and minerals, calcium, copper, potassium, magnesium, manganese, sodium, phosphorus, zinc. Any of that stuff have a five pound bag of sugar? I <laughs> know. There's none of that in nectar. There's none of that in sugar. And that's what you're missing when you feed sugar instead of nectar or honey. You're missing all of that. Sugar syrup or high fructose corn syrup is not and will never be as good as nectar, period. Know that when you are feeding sugar because you didn't leave enough food on last fall and you have to be feeding next spring. What you're feeding them is junk food. You go back and say, okay, I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to leave enough money on. Now, no honey coming in, they eat it all, then, then, then it's an emergency, and that's what you're stuck with. But, if you have a choice, honey, sugar syrup, it's an easy choice. Don't feed sugar syrup if you can avoid it. It's just, it's, it's a 10% value of, of real nectar. A worker needs about 11 milligrams of sugar today, and you can read the, the numbers there of how much sugar a colony is going to eat in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, a day. And a, and a, Season, we have uh, 22 pounds of sugar, or 22 teaspoons of sugar a day in the stuff that we eat. I'd like to do that all at once. 22, I'm not sure I could, but we. I mean, <laughs> what does that? I don't know. We eat a lot of sugar. We eat, we eat more sugar than we need to, but bees need a lot of sugar. And, and your job is to make sure that they have enough of it all of the time. Uh, nectar flows, the nice thing about a nectar flow, all sorts of things ripple effect. Once you've got a lot of nectar coming in, you have to have some place to put it. Well, if I'm going to take nectar, I've got to have some place to put it, I want that place to be clean, so suddenly I get a lot of hygienic behavior going on in the colony. And they're cleaning out those cells and they're getting rid of the junk and they're making, they're polishing the wax in there. What they're doing is they're getting rid of this leftover sludge from last fall. They're getting rid of the old, the old cocoons, they're getting rid of the mold that was growing on the cells. They're cleaning house. 
And all of that stuff that goes out the front door is all of that stuff that isn't going to bother them the rest of the summer. They're, 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 they're getting rid of that. And now that I've got enough food, if I've got Hector, you can bet you've got pollen. So if I've got Hector coming in, I've got pollen coming in, and I've got Hector and pollen, I can start raising kids. i got enough food to feed them. Now the one thing that bees don't have a lot of for a while is how long is the snack of flow going to last. But that's where when you're looking for bees that are adapted to your location, you've got bees that have got seasons figured out. They already know that when the daylight, the day period of the daylight is this long, I can probably pretty much figure that I've got about two more weeks of nectar flow before it starts sliding off. If I get bees from Northern California or Southern Georgia, they don't have a clue of what's going on in Northern Ohio. So I want local bees. bees local bees know that when I hit, when I hit the summer solstice, life slows down. And there isn't going to be as much food coming in, and I need to I need food to raise the kids. Bees in southern Georgia don't pay any attention to that because they got food all summer long. And they're just going to keep eating, right? So when you're getting your bees from wherever, know that they are already have innately know that summer solstice is the trigger and what's going to happen after that happens. Is it going to continue or is it going to slow down? My bees slow down. Our bees almost stop until the water mark comes back up. And then we have another flow. But between summer solstice and golden red, we don't have much at all. And my bees know that because they're local bread. So know that. <clears throat> all of these things, all of these things happen when you have an egg flow, you get more pollen, you get more kids, you get you have heavy bees. And your job is to know when that egg flow is going on. How can you tell there's an egg flow going on? You stand outside your colony and see what's going on? You know, without having to take the cover off? Well, you should be able to. Watch it. And, and here's two things to do. Learn to learn, learn what's, watch what's going on outside and then look at what's happening inside. Go down to that bottom box in your group box and pick up one of the frames on the dance floor and see what's going on. Watch those dances. Are there two bees dancing? Are there four bees dancing? Are there 12 bees dancing? If you've got one or two or three bees dancing, there's not much going on. An observation time is really good here, because you don't have to go down to that bottom blue box. You can watch it inside your house. And that's something you may want to think about. But what's going on in the dance floor? You've got 12 bees dancing. There's a lot going on. You're also going to have, because before you did that, you watched bees coming in, and they're coming in so fast you can't count them. They're coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in. Then you take a look at the dance floor, and yep, there's 12, 13 bees dancing. And then you take a look at the upstairs, and you go up that top honey super, and there's bees. Every third cell's got a bee with their head stuck in it. Regurgitating that heck of snoring it up here. That's why you need room for nectar, because they need that short period of time to store that nectar so they can be hydrated. So you've got bees coming, you've got dancers going on, and you've got bees storing nectar. That's a honey flow. That's what you need to be seeing. Next time, you won't have to be looking at the dance floor of bees and herpes. You're going to be able to say, yep, the bees coming and coming and coming and coming and coming in. And they don't have a lot of pollen on them either, usually. Some of them will. But a lot of the nectar collectors won't bother collecting pollen. They're just bringing their nectar just as fast as they can get it. And once you see that, you see, okay, I can see what's going on. I don't have to go look at the rest of the entire colony. I know what's going to be happening in three weeks. I know what's going on inside. I know my bees are going to need more room. All sorts of things click when you see that behavior going on at the front door. So learn to see that because it will make you a better beekeeper and allow your bees to do better because you're taking care of them. When life gets bad and that nectar flow shuts off, you've got a deficiency. The first thing that happens, of course, is the defensive behavior picks up. It's mine, you ain't taking it, period. And, and getting inside of a hive suddenly got a little more difficult. Suddenly you've got these right here from this and leave me alone. This is ours. We work hard. Get out of here. And that's what they're doing. There will be fewer quality, you, have, you won't have this behavior at the front door. Some maybe, but not much. Not nearly as much as you did a week ago when you had that flow going on. You won't see, if, if you watch closely, you will see these, mostly what they do is they come in and they land on the, on the landing board and they kind of screech to a halt and then they look and then they walk in. 
But when you've got a neck to flow going on like mad, they don't land. They just fly right in the front door. And if you've ever seen behavior from African-American honeybees, that's exactly what they do. But your bees will do the same sort of thing when there's, they've got to get in and get out because there's still stuff out there I got to go play. They don't even stop. They'll fly right in the front door. <coughs> you don't have that when the neck flow shuts off. <coughs> you've got no neck coming in. Got no reason to clean cells, my jet behavior goes down. Suddenly stuff starts happening inside that wasn't happening before because they kept cleaning, kept cleaning, kept cleaning, kept cleaning, and now that's not happening. You've got not enough food. Your brood nest begins to shrink. I'm not you've got enough food, they don't feed the queen, the queen quits laying, and suddenly your brood nest, your brood, and your brood nest begins to shrink in size. If you're keeping good notes, you know that your queen was laying 2,400 eggs a day two weeks ago when you were out here. And now you're looking at it and you're going, that's half the brood we were was two weeks ago, just so I can tell by looking at the frame. It was two thirds full of brood and now it's only a third full of brood, so the queen is not laying. So all these things that add up, and you can say, okay, none of this is going on. Smaller brood nests, got problems with the brood nests, with pests and diseases. I got my, my neck and flow shut down. And, and, and once, once you get to the point of having done this for three or four years, it just registers why you even have to think about it. And the first thing is probably the, the traffic at the front door. That's your first clue. If there's not traffic at the front door, you know that there's what's going on. Because three weeks ago, there was all of this. And suddenly, your job inside that colony has just changed. You went out there to add room, and now you're going to have to take that room off or something. So learning those tricks is going to is going to help your bees because you're going to be doing the right thing for them. <clears throat> water. Bees get a lot of their water from nectar, of course. And when you say a half a half gallon to a gallon of colony in hot summer months, some of that's coming from nectar. And depending on how much nectar is coming in, it may be a lot or almost all of that. And depending on What's not coming in the front door, they all may be water they have to go collect, and your job is to make sure that there's water out there for them to collect. Is there a creek or stream or a pond nearby? That's one thing. If there's not, then you're going to be out there, and you're going to be filling that bird bath or whatever it is probably more often, because they're going to need that. Money. <coughs> they use water for cooling, the hive, or the apple transpiration. They will bring water into the hive, they'll put it on top bars, and they fan it, and that water evaporates, heat goes with it. And it cools the hive that way, and they're going to do that right below uh, the, the brood nest, go right in the brood nest, so that you're keeping the brood nest temperature even, not too hot, not too cold. And, and the other thing that, that they use it for is I'm thirsty, I'm not going to, I need a drink. They're just going to use it to, to uh, rehydrate themselves. But they need that much water every day, and they're going to find it someplace. They're going to find it in your neighbor's swimming pool or someplace. Your job is to make sure it's not your neighbor's swimming pool, unless you're really good friends with your neighbor, or we're really good, good friends with your neighbor. Uh, here's a, this is one of those neat things that, it's called virtual water. Uh, and as much water does it take to produce all of the things that you see there. And, and, and one of the things, it takes about 1.3 gallons of water to produce a single almond. And if you don't, know, there's 200 million, no, it's 100 million acres of almonds in California today that are, that are producing fruit. So you can imagine how much water they are spending to produce that many almonds. But it takes about 1,500 meters of water to produce a kilo of honey or 400 gallons of water to produce a pound of honey, and, and that 400 gallons is all of the water it takes to produce all of the plants that grew to make all of the flowers that they collected nectar from. But you got to go someplace, and you need 400 gallons of water somewhere to produce all of the plants to produce that much honey. And if you know how much honey your colony is produced, suddenly you're going, it's a lot of water to make, you know, a 60, a 60 Oh, There's a lot of water out there. And if you haven't had water, then you're going to run into issues with that. Uh, what else are bees eating? The many sides of modern food production. Fungicides are everywhere. Fungicides, pesticides, and herbicides. Uh, they're everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. But I don't, I don't think.
think there's a place on the planet that doesn't have some exposure to this stuff. And it's, it's modern agriculture. And, and you can curse it or you can be one of the people that's applying it, it doesn't make any difference. We have to live with it, and your bees have to live with it, and they're constantly exposed to this stuff. And you may, you may never be sprayed. You may never suffer a mosquito spray in town. You may never be sprayed in, in, in uh, cotton or corn or any of those crops. Um, but your bees are still out there picking the stuff up and bringing it home. Parts per billion. But it's parts per billion. Constant pressure on them. And that's part of their diet. And that's part of the stress that they're always going under. Development. Uh, you see that black line in that map? Fifty-five percent of the U.S. population lives on that black line. Forty-five percent of us live in the middle someplace else. I live on that black line. Up on the Great Lakes. So, where is all the food being produced? And where are all the people living who are eating all of that food? And you can see that there's some risk of pressure there. If you live close to that black line, then you by the way you do. Uh, you're going to have issues with, is there enough food out there? Or are we, we have, hey, John Miller is a commercial honey producer in North Dakota and Northern California, and he says, hey, that's the last problem. He's exactly right. It's once, once they put it in a parking lot, you're not going to get sweet clover out of there ever again. So that's another issue that we're having problems with. It's not enough good food. Monocultures are efficient for food in terms of how much food per acre, but uh, there are deserts as far as everything else is concerned. There's nothing out there. There's nothing in a cornfield except a little bit of pollen for about, what, six days to two weeks, depending on the weather. Otherwise, the whole season, there's nothing out there. And there's, after, after it castles, there's nothing out there again. All of these crops are in modern cultures are basically the same way. There may be a bloom, but there may be food there in the short run. It's up. Almonds in California. It's a month of bloom, and it's 11 months of dirt. And that's it. So, you know, you don't stay there. It's a, it's a food desert you know, for the rest of the time. So, uh, there's a lot of food for a short while, but the rest of the time, we're in these belts. So, the bees got to go someplace else to get food because there's nothing there. All right, lots of food. Nutrition management. What can you do to take advantage of all of this stuff that we've just talked about and make your management more efficient? And, and the questions that I ask are, why would you be feeding? No matter what it is you're feeding, why would you be feeding? And you'd be feeding for spring buildup. And there you're looking at sugar and protein. You'd be, if you produce nukes or packages or splits, again, sugar and protein. You want a large population of bees. So just what happens when you, put in, when you put a nectar and pollen into a colony? They start raising more food. That's what you're looking for. Queen production, sugar and protein. Uh, if you're looking to encourage pollen collection, like in almonds, you're going to feed lots and lots of sugar and no protein because you don't you want them to have to go look for protein, so they're out uh, pollinating almond blossoms. Nectar girth, bad weather, poor location, sugar, maybe protein is what you're feeding. If you're going to boost winter stores, and that's at 150 pounds that I was talking about that we have to have a pollen yet, and it's 130. I've got to get 20 pounds of something in there in a hurry. It's got to be 20 pounds of sugar. So I'm going to either add honey if I have it, and then if not, then it's just going to be the old white sugar. And if you've got an emergency feed, you've got a colony in the middle of December, and you go out and you have to, and it's eight pounds, you know you've got a problem, and you've got to get something in there right now, so you're just going to spray sugar. If you want to stimulate the buildup, um, and, and think, of, think of what goes on during the season. If your colony, if it's spring and you want your colony to start taking off population-wise, what would you be feeding them? And what, and what you would be feeding them is what nature is providing, which is a thin, thin, thin sugar syrup. You're not going to be feeding them honey. You want to, you want to stimulate behavior. You don't want them to be satisfied. So you're going to be feeding one-to-one -one or even seven. Nectar is about 40% sugar. So should you be feeding two to one sugar to get sugar in there? You know, you're going to go at least a half to one, maybe. You want, you want what's coming into the colony to mimic nature. And what's coming in, uh, into your colony that mimics nature is really, 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 really thin sugar syrup. That's nectar. That's what you want to be feeding them. And, and this, may, this may 
driving people crazy, but it works. I could put a four gallon feeder on top of a colony, and there's always food there. There's always food, there's food there for two weeks. But is that what Mother Nature provides? What does Mother Nature provide? She provides you some in the morning, and then it shuts off in the afternoon, and it's gone by late afternoon. And then the next morning, it's, it's again, rather than constant feeding all day long. If you want to do what Mother Nature does, and, and which tells the bees what they need to do, you're putting on at least <laughs> less than once a month. If you, could, if you could feed them a little bit every day, you would be Mother Nature. I don't have that kind of time. But if you want it, if you've got that kind of time, and you want the bees to make it, it's great. And I got Hector coming in all morning, but by lunchtime, the paper's off. So I've got to get as much as I can every morning, because I know I'm not going to get any more this afternoon, and I've got to cure it all night long, so I've got honey to feed. And then next morning, it comes in, that's what you want to be doing. You want to be mimicking nature. And, and everybody's looking at me and going, is this guy nuts? We don't have that kind of time, and most of us don't. But if you want to make it work, um, try that. And try, try to see. Take, a, take four colonies. Two of them give as much as they can. Put a gallon bucket on. Two of them give a pint general. And see who takes the most sugar syrup the fastest. And I'll bet you the pint jar will take a pint faster than the gallon pail. Because they know that we've got to take it out because it's going to run out. These guys are going, I see it all the time. You don't have to work. Who cares? These guys are being pressured. Try to see if I'm not right. Uh, open feeding, don't. It used to be a really common way to feed. Commercial beekeepers just put a 55 gallon drum of high purpose corn syrup in the middle of the bee yard. And go, go for it, girls. But you know, when you're scooping up scoops and scoops of dead bees because of the fighting and you've got bees coming in from everybody else in the county, you don't want to be sharing the wealth or having them share the wealth with you. So if you're tempted to do open feeding, think twice about it. <coughs> if, you're, if you're stimulating the packages, uh, split feed, if you're making, if you're making juice to sell, you want as many bees as you can get in so you're getting as much food as you can in as fast as you can as early as you can. And it's not just like we're putting some on and hoping they make. You're really pushing food. You're really pushing food. And, and part of it is, let's go back to the quality of the queen that was in that colony last fall. Is she able to produce enough eggs this spring to make enough so when you get all of that food up there, she can keep up with that egg laying. And so part of this is not only food, it's the quality of the queen. And she's producing how many eggs today? Now you know. You can say she's producing lots and lots of eggs. She's not producing nearly enough eggs, whatever it is. If she's not producing enough, you're not going to have enough bees, and you're not going to be able to make splits of news. So go back to last summer and, and check the quality of the queen that you've had then and see that. Make sure that she's up to speed, so once you give them all that food, they can use it. If you're making queens, what do, what do bees make queens normally? Swarm season, right? Early spring, what's coming in in early spring? Thin, thin syrup, not the heavy stuff. If you're raising queens, you want to stimulate. You don't want to, you don't want to just feed, you want to stimulate. You want to, you want to make them want more. You want to make them accurate. So you're putting in a really, a really light syrup. One to one, one half to one. That's what you're feeding your colony that's raising the queen. They're going to work harder for it because it isn't quite enough. So they're going to be working harder for it. As opposed to all of you give them dumb and don't have a you're, you are Mother Nature, and Mother Nature doesn't give them 40 gallons of feed all at once in a pail up here. Do you know, do you know what the dance is on the dance floor that says there's four gallons of feed about a foot and a half above you? There isn't one. It's smell. They have to find it. And, and sometimes they don't, but, it, but they have to find it. But there's a dance that says there's a clover field right over there that's in full bloom, and is it good? And she will get that forage, you'll get bunches of them coming back and forth. That's what you want. You want that, come, that sort of stimulation. Again, I talked about almond, almond pollination, and it, the people who, who pollinate almonds are going to put lots and lots of sugar on their colonies. Um, high fructose corn syrup 
there isn't enough, there's enough high harvest corn syrup in Southern California in February to float in Southern California for this reason. It's because I want all the carbs in that colony that that colony can possibly collect, and I don't want any protein, so that the minute those bones start to blossom, I've got every bee in the colony out collecting protein because I got kids I got to raise. And that's what you're doing. You're feeding, you're feeding sugar, and you're letting them collect protein. Now, if you're doing any pollination, apples or anything else, this works. And, and that's what you want to be doing. You want your bees to be doing what you want your bees to be doing, which is collecting protein, which is visiting, visiting those flowers and pollinating, as opposed to some collecting nectar or nectar and pollen. You find everybody collecting pollen to increase that food set. If you run into a summer earth, then what you want is what are colonies eating in the summer anyway? Well, there's nectar flows coming in, but if, even if the nectar flows full, they're eating honey. They're feeding their brood honey and they're eating honey. That's what they're doing in the middle of the summer. That's what you want to be feeding them. It's a thicker syrup, three to one. Three to one. How thick can you make it? Can you make it four to one and have it come out of the pail? Maybe try that. See what happens. What's honey? Honey is, is 80% sugar, 20% water, is 82. Can you, can you make 82 and get that into a colony and have them go eat it? But that's what you want to be feeding, is when you've got the earth in the summer, they're eating honey, you want to be feeding them. Or something similar to honey. And that's what you're looking at here, is <coughs> as sick as you can get. Um, you make fewer trips to the bee yard, too. There's a lot to be said for that. You don't want to do overfeeding, you don't want to start a robbing situation, uh, and which, which is never good, but you want, you want as much sugar as you can get into that colony, and that's going to be a thick syrup. Ah, uh, try this again. Here we are. Come fall, I want to start storing food. I want my bees to be making honey to store. Again, very thick. Two parts of water, even, even thicker. How much thicker? Because what they're doing is they're storing honey. They're not stimulating in the spring, and, and they're not kind of making up for a dearth in the summer. They're storing it. I want them to be able to get as much as they can into them much of that colony as I can get them in. Now I have winter and winter, my winter is going to certainly be different than yours. So you've got, you can look at that and say, okay, I can ramp that down a little bit because I'm not going to have that much snow or cold weather. But still, it's the same thing. You, you don't want to, if you feed them uh, thin syrup, thin syrup, you're starting to stimulate them to raise the population. And you don't want a big population going into winter of hungry kids, you want that population to start trailing down. So no stimulation, and, and start kicking them up and just sit into uh, <coughs> If you can see the difference here, winter, you've heard of fat bodies, and this is how bees store food in their own bodies. And a lot of food in the colony in winter is stored within individual bees. And then the fat body is primarily for the gelatin, which is a type of protein. But you can see that on the top is the fat body, and the bottom is the summer bee without, without hardly any fat bodies. And this is, now you can do this at home. You can, you can go in October and you can say, how, how do my bees look relative to the store fat in their bodies? Because this fat is part of what they're going to be feeding the young next spring. This is stored food. From the colony's perspective, I've got it right here, and when I need it, I can feed, I can digest some of this, this, this fat, and I can feed it to the kids. So you need bees with a lot of fat bodies, and here's how you find out how we're doing. <coughs> it's hard on the bee. But in October, or yeah, start in October, you've got to get eight or ten, eight or ten workers. And you put them in a jar, you put them in the freezer, and you take them home until and you put them in the freezer and you're dead. Okay, you, you've frozen them. You take one out and you take a piece of wax or cork or something and you take this bee and you strike her out on her back like this. You know, so her legs are spread out. And she's dead. And then you take, I always used to say your wife's best sewing scissors, but I, I was accused of being somewhat gender biased here. So you take a really good pair of sewing scissors and you cut around the outside of the abdomen. And what you'll do is you get a flap. And you can lift that flap up, that's what you'll see. It'll take you two or three to get it right. 
But that's what you'll see. If it's nice and white, you've got lots of fat and your bees are doing well. If it's not, you've got a problem. And you know you've got a problem. If you can do that, you can do this at home. And you know, they, you can do 10 bees in five minutes. It, it doesn't take very long at all once you get used to it. But then you'll know how are your bees doing for store fat in their fat bodies in the fall, and I still got time. I can still get protein into that colony. In October here, that's a piece of cake. You can be putting on uh, protein stimulant, and you can get more fat into that colony. And they can store it, and they'll have it next spring when they need it to start feeding the young. Now, here's the deal. If you've been following the literature lately, uh, you know that what is varroa feeding on? Fat bodies. So if your varroa population is higher than it should be, which would be almost zero, that's what they're attacking. So you may have lots of bees, your bees may have lots of fat bodies, but if you've got lots of varroa, that's going to be challenged come spring because that's what they're feeding on. So not only do you have to have those fat bodies, you have to have varroa control in your colony at the same time. Actually, you need it back in July and August because you're checking these in October. And if life is good and you've done your, your work right, you're going to have lots of fat bodies that are going to be raw. And you, you can be pretty sure that come spring, life is going to be good in that colony because you've done everything you needed to do when you needed to do it. Or what your protein is. You've got to get protein in your colony. And you, okay, I, my fat, I don't have my bees, so not enough of my bees have fat bodies, and the fat bodies they have are large enough, I need to get protein in there. There's a lot of different ways to solve it. Now, you all have pollen traps, so you can trap pollen all summer, so you can feed that that way. Yes. Yes. Okay. But if you don't, if you don't, you can get your, you can get either dry pollen supplement or the patty pollen supplement. And here's a here's a here's a thing to know about these things. If you have to feed pollen supplement, the bees will store the dry stuff. They'll pack it into cells just like pollen. They turn the patties into fat bodies. So you can put lots and lots and lots of patties on, and you look in that colony and say, where did they put it? It's not here. Well, they turned it into fat bodies and they're storing it for next spring. The dry stuff, they poke it into, they're pouring it into cells and they're packing it down with their little heads and they're storing it for next spring because that's another resource that they have. So they've got two resources for fat and for protein next spring. One they store in their bodies and one they store in the cells. So if you're feeding the patties, know that you're not going to see much. And you're going to wonder what the heck they did with it. If you're feeding the powder, know that they're going to store that and that's what you should be seeing. That band around the honey or that band around the brood nest, wherever it is. And, and know that going in. And you won't be surprised when you go looking and it's there. <coughs> if you have to feed carbs, again, sugar syrup. I even we use fondant. The fondant is the stuff you get at bakeries. Um, it comes in 50 pound boxes, and the nice thing about finding is zero labor, zero broken jars, and only one trip to the one trip to the bee yard. It comes in a 50 pound box, you slice it in, you know, 10 pound chunks, and you put it on the top bars. So I put the uh, empty scooper above it, and I go home. And I don't, when I come back the next time, I just put another slice of fun on the top bars. It's, for us, it's easy, it's fast. And it's relatively relatively simple because of our time. I will never feed sugar syrup again just because of the issues of labor, the time, and broken jars, and mess, and mess, and mess. Find it works. You can put dry sugar on if you need to. Honey, of course, is the best thing. You can put super honey on this and that's all this. But uh, if you don't, then you go with find it. You can have to do emergency feed. Uh, you can dry sugar, you can make candy corns, you can and if you get out there and you got a warm day in December and you take a look and that colony weighs 60 pounds, you know that you've got a problem. And you need to get some food in there right now. The bees are, you take the cover off, the bees are all on the, on the top bars of the top super warm. Food! <laughs> then that's what you do. These things work easy. Uh, Fascinating. You get dry sugar. Anybody here ever use candy boards more than once? They work really well, but they're a lot of work. Um, you're, you're heating sugar and water and you're letting it get hard and you're using equipment that you don't use for anything else. Um, but they work. And if that works for you. Uh, <coughs> quick question on these two frames. You've seen bees that die over winter. 
Why did they die? And when you take a look at it, when you take a look at the frame, you can kind of pretty much tell. He's on the top. Ran out of food. Pure and simple. There just wasn't enough food in the colony. They got to the top. There's an old saying about starvation in the colony in the winter. The top is the bottom. It wants to be easier to the top of the top super. They're at the bottom of their food source. And that's pretty much it. That's what happened to these bees. They just flat ran out of food. The frame on the bottom didn't have enough bees. They just they couldn't break across to get that inch next to that honey. They couldn't get that far over to get that food, which is one of the reasons bees don't rule the world. Is that right there is they can't figure out how to get over there. Sometimes they can. And and but but your job as a beekeeper is to make sure that you have enough bees in your colony going into winter that I have enough bees that bees can get across the side of the frame and onto the other side. Because that's where the honey is. So I got enough bees I can get there, these bees can feed, these bees can feed, these bees, and I can get it back to the other side where all the rest of the bees are and a little bit of brood I've got in there, or top and bottom. But you have to have enough bees. You're otherwise you end up with something like that. All of these are preventable. Enough having enough bees in the fall and having enough food in the fall. And and your job is to make sure that that's received. So there you are, honey bee nutrition, enough good food all the time for every bee and bunch. There you go. I'm supposed to say something.